Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Arkansas Department of Energy and Environment's webinar on electric vehicle station equipment programs for 2022. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, the mission of the Arkansas Energy Office is to promote energy efficiency, clean technology, sustainability strategies that encourage economic development, energy security, and environmental well being for all citizens of Arkansas. Now, my name is Jason Willie. I'm a policy manager here at the Arkansas Energy Office. And moderating the chat today is Chet Howland. He's the manager of strategic energy initiatives at the Arkansas Energy Office. So, let me switch over and we'll get started. Okay, uh, today's webinar will be recorded and the slides and the recording will be posted on the ENE website with the program's guidance documents. Uh, this information in the webinar is an overview of both programs and we recommend reviewing all the guidance and the documentation before submitting an application. Um, if you could remain muted during the webinar, we'll have some time for questions at the end of the presentation, but you can also put questions in the chat and uh, we can address them there too. Okay, here we go. Uh, there are two electrical vehicle supply equipment or EVSE programs for 2022, the level two EVSE reimbursement rebate program and the DC fast charge funding assistance program. Both programs are funded from the Volkswagen Mitigation Settlement, which is to be used towards projects that reduce emissions from motor vehicles. There's more information about the settlement on the ENE website. And there's also more information about other programs involved with the VW settlement uh, on the ENE website. The Level 2 program rebates are based on the cost and type of installation. There's $215,000 in funding for this year. And in 2021, 53 new stations received rebates under the program. The DC Fast Charge Funding Assistance Program provides funding assistance of up to 75% of project costs with a cap of $350,000 per project. There's $1,075,000 available in 2022. Level two versus DC Fast Charge. Level two chargers supply a minimum of seven kilowatts of power to the EV during charging. This equates to about 30 miles of range per hour. The national average for installation is approximately $8,000, though we've seen somewhat uh, lower average here in Arkansas. Um, the eligible installations include municipalities, state agencies, apartment complexes, fleet services, and others, but no single family private res residences. And uh, below uh, at the bottom, there's some uh, examples from projects from the first year. Um, then DC fast charge, uh, direct current fast charge or DCFC delivers a minimum of 150 kilowatts of power per charger. This delivers up to 400 miles of range per hour uh, in charging, depending on the vehicle, uh, DCFC installations average around $100,000 in costs. For this program, uh, the installations must be along a major interstate or other designated transportation corridor in Arkansas, and we'll go over those corridors in a little bit. Uh, there are nine DCFC public stations in Arkansas at the moment, excluding Tesla stations. Um, and projects in the DCFC program must be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Oops. There we go. Uh, so we'll go over the level two reimbursement guidance uh, first. And I get my mouse over there. Okay. Um, these are the categories of the rebates and the reimbursement rates for each. Uh, government owned installations are rebated at 90%. Uh, with the caps indicated. An uh, example of this would be uh, Eureka Springs um, put some chargers in downtown parking lots uh, last year. So that's the rebate levels they would have been rebated at. Um, Non-government 
are reimbursed at 70%. Um, that would be an example of that would be if you were a restaurant or perhaps you had a shopping center and you wanted to install some chargers there. And finally, the installations uh, that are not publicly accessible, such as uh, fleet charging behind a fence or a gate or an apartment building where the charging is intended for mostly residents are both reimbursed at 50% with the associated caps. And uh, the application um, must be submitted by the owner of the equipment uh, this year. Um, the rebate will also be issued in their name. Third parties may not submit applications on behalf of the owner. Applications are processed on a first come first serve basis. Um, incomplete applications will be notified and will need to update their application with the missing materials. Incomplete applications will not hold their place in line. Um, the applications are on a first come first serve basis. And um, all the EVSC installed must have a minimum of seven kilowatts of output per charger and must use the J1772J plug coupler, which is pretty much the industry standard right now. All stations must be maintained and operated, warrantied and networked connected for a minimum of five years. And dual port stations or stations that can charge more than one EV at a time are considered one station. So now let's look at what a station is. This is an example of a station in the city of Lone Oak. Um, Lone Oak put these in last year. They're publicly accessible. Um, right here we see two chargers on the same installation pole. Each has a single port or plug, which is that cord with the little um, white uh, plug on it. And these would be considered two single port stations that were government owned and they would qualify for reimbursement at the 90% and up or 90% level up to uh, $6,850 uh, per installation. And uh, the documentation you will need, all of this information is in the guidance, um, but essentially you're going to need to supply uh, copies of paid invoices for equipment, uh, the warranty, network service plans, as well as uh, associate installation costs. If there were any permits taken out, you'll need to uh, submit a copy of those as well. And uh, we'd like a simple drawing or blueprint of the installation with the dimensions um, for the parking spaces, and confirmation of third-party access for E&E &E, uh, to network data, and then photos of the finished installation. And again, you can get the details on all of that in the guidance. Okay, let's move on to DCFC, DC Fast Charge. Um, Installations are required to be located in Arkansas with a maximum distance of 50 miles to a designated transportation corridor. We'll look at a map of the corridors in just a sec. Projects will be scored higher the closer they are to a corridor exit. Uh, must be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to the public. And they must be well illuminated, uh, located near or within destinations that offer amenities such as restrooms, dining, shopping, entertainment, et cetera. Um, and uh, you will be required to have a project site agreement um, to ensure that uh, the equipment will remain at the site and operational for the five-year period. Equipment must be maintained and operated connected to a network for five years. And again, this is an overview. Detailed guidance uh, should be looked at when you're building your applications uh, for either program. And then these are the designated electric vehicle transportation corridors in Arkansas at the moment. Uh, as you'll see, it is the major interstates and Highway 67 from North Little Rock up to the Missouri border. Um, and these are the corridors uh, that you would build around for the DC program. Um, I just want to note that for the L2 program, the corridors do not come into consideration. So do not worry about them if you're doing level two. Oh, bless you. Um, D 
DC funding assistance application guidance. Uh, the deadline is on April 30th and the application will be scored on the criteria that you see here. Um, there's descriptions of each criteria and what we're looking for in the guidance. Uh, we won't go over those in detail today, but you can look at those later in the guidance. Terms and conditions. Um, these are terms and conditions that both uh, programs are going to share. The charging stations must use the open charge point protocol. Most EVSE should be using this anyway. Um, E and E must be granted network access for five years, and the applicant will provide charging data to the E and E during that time. Uh, we're still working out exactly how that uh, reporting is going to work, um, but uh, we'll need that for the five years um, after installation. Stations must be registered to the Alternative Fuel Data Center, which lists all the various kinds of alt fuel stations in each state. And a and &E, e and e retains the right to partially refund a rebate if the remaining funds are insufficient to fulfill the rebate. E, e makes no representations expressed or implied regarding the design, construction, reliability, performance, operation, maintenance, or use of any equipment awarded under this rebate. Any decision regarding this selection, design, purchase, installation, use, and operation of any equipment other than the terms and conditions specified shall be at the sole discretion and are the sole responsibility of the applicant. Now, these are ineligible costs for the programs. Um, and um, installations completed prior to February 1st of this year or after December 1st of this year. Um, purchase of uh, or rental of real estate or other capital costs. Um, any uh, EVSC located in a single family or private residence leased or pre-owned equipment, uh, everything should be new equipment, and upgrades or replacement of existing uh, EVSC equipment are not allowed. And then um, EVSC owned or installed by Volkswagen or any of its subsidiaries uh, are not allowed under this program. And as I mentioned, all the stations must be maintained, operated, and have network service for five years. If for some reason the applicant is uh, unable to comply with this requirement, they will be asked to pay back the rebate on a prorated basis as shown in the table. And this is also in the guidance um, if you wanna go study that later. Application instructions. Uh, and we are in the home stretch now, everyone. Here we go. Um, apply online using the ePortal on the e, e website. All the applications will be submitted this way and supporting documentation will be uploaded here. After you submit the application, you'll receive an email confirming E&E &E received it and it will have an ID number on it. So um, you can look your application up in the portal. Be sure to hold on to that email for future reference. Um, and you can see the specific guidance for uh, each program will have uh, more of the application requirements in it. And if you have any issues or questions with the um, application process or the ePortal, just get in contact with me. Um, my contact information is on both of the application sites. Uh, you, it's right there at the right, so you won't be able to miss it. Um, and then... To get to the ePortal, you go to our uh, homepage and then you go to online services and go and click on ePortal and it'll take you right there and you can register your account so that you can enter your applications. And then the links for the specific program applications will be the, down there under forms. Um, and those will go live uh, next on Tuesday the 1st. Uh, so if you go there today, they probably will not show up. And now we're gonna open it up to questions. Um, I have not looked in the chat, but uh, if you wanna unmute yourself or put it in the chat, um, if you have any questions we can answer right now. Hey, good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes. 
Hey, this is Scott Barrios. I'm the Electric Mobility Program Manager for Entergy uh, okay. Utility, obviously serving most of uh, Arkansas. A uh, few questions on the DC fast charging. Uh, when we look at costs, um, what type of utility infrastructure costs would be covered in that installation cost? Transformers, poles, and wires that would you would would be required in that construction installation of that uh, that fast charger. That's that's the first part of my question. Okay. Um... It's going to depend, you know, it's going to vary from site to site. And um, it's the probably the cost is it's going to be dependent on exactly well, what it is. I mean, you, you, yeah, I'm, I'm very intimately familiar with the cost associated. Will that cost okay. be covered is what I'm getting at. I apologize. Right. And what I'm I'm saying, it's going to depend on what the actual um what the actual installation cost is. Um, I don't have a, I guess I don't have a specific answer for you if um, it would be covered because it, it would depend on what the actual action was or what was being installed. Um, as far I, as- I think, I think I'll speak on behalf of the utilities. We definitely, any DC fast charging, mo I'll say, most DC fast charging applications will require some type of grid upgrade. Right. And I think we need to clarify if that cost would be covered as part of the installation. Scott, I can jump in real quick. Uh, yeah. Electrical upgrades and interconnection costs are eligible expenses. Thank you. Okay, that's what I wanted to clarify. Thank you, Chet, appreciate that. Okay, anyone that else? Answers my... Oh, sorry. Uh, that answers my question, thank you. Okay. Hey, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hey, Jeff Franklin, uh, doing uh, Franklin's charging here in Little Rock and Hot Springs, and we're looking at trying to do another installation. Piggyback in on uh, what this, uh, what that gentleman had to say uh, and the answer given. When you're talking about upgrades uh, to the electric system, are we talking about transformers and underground as well? Uh, because you know there, there's a lot of that that goes into 90% of these installations. So I understand what he's saying about three phase power coming in that y'all would be it'd be eligible for that. But then we're talking about putting a transformer in and running a bunch of underground conduit. Is that part of the associated cost that would be covered in the DC uh, program? Chip says yes. Again, yes. Again, yes. Okay, cool. That's all I got. Uh, do we have any other questions? Before we wrap things up. Hi, uh, this is Kitty from Adopt a Charger. Hey, and Kitty. Hi. Um, I have a couple questions. I was wondering if donated EV charging stations qualify for this program. You mean for the uh, level two or for the DC? Um, for the level the two. Well, I'm, I'm mainly involved in the level two. So I'm right. wondering for the level two, you know, community opportunities, if uh, donated EV charging stations can be considered or if they have to be purchased with an invoice. Um, I don't see why not. Um, you know, the associated costs of um, the installation could still receive a reimbursement and I guess any cost associated with the networking and warranty, those things, if those weren't part of the donation, then those should be able to receive uh, reimbursement as far as I know. Thank you so much for that answer. And You're welcome. also I'm, I'm wondering, I'm just gonna be straight out there with you that I can spend all the money available in your level two EV rebate just from the people on the waiting list that didn't weren't able to get funding from the program in 2021. So I'm wondering if there's any provision for when that $215,000 gets exhausted, if we could like, you know, get the money a little bit earlier from 2023. And the reason I bring this up is it is a lot to get everything in line with supply chain issues and, um, you know, contractors being overwhelmed with with jobs and things like that. So it's 
it's difficult if you're working with the city to get, you know, the agreement and everything in place. And then but at that point, it could be as early as June, there might not be money in the program to actually execute. So I'm wondering if there's a provision for when the money runs out. Um, right now, you know, we, we have gotten that feedback, not only um, from you, but from other uh, participants and, and uh, people that wanted to participate. Um, and we're going to, you know, use the funding that we have right now and then um, revisit other funding sources and see if there's any possible um, other funds out there to use for the same program. At this time, we don't have anything solidified that, you know, when this funding runs out, we're immediately going to move to another pot of funding. That's um, not something that we uh, have right now but it is definitely something that we're talking about and looking into. And, you know, if there's any announcements about that, we will, um, you know, send that out through everyone's emails um, and put it on the site and all those things. So, and it will be reflected in the balance that you see on the site too for the L2 program. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hey, uh, it's Rob Smith with the Northwest Arkansas Council. Um, I had two questions. Um, I believe your side slide presentation um, said that uh, within 50 miles of an alternative fuels corridor, I'm wondering if you meant to say five miles of an alternative fuel corridor. Um, that's the first question. I guess you can flip back through the slides and figure out if I'm right or wrong. Uh, um, it does say 50 and we did mean to say 50. Okay, I was I was think I would I would have expected it to be less, so that's good to know. Right, that's um, uh, more to do with the federal funding. Yeah, the the, sec the second question is is uh, US four twelve. I've communicated with Chet some about uh, getting that designated an alternative fuels corridor. Um, are you working on that? What's what's the plan? Um, I can I can take that, Jason. Okay, uh, there's there's a. Uh, request for additional corridors put out by the Federal Highway Administration um, annually. It's a bit later than normal this year. Uh, I expect because of the rollout of the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, from what we understand, that will uh, those nominations will be uh, available sometime this spring. And we will certainly uh, work with any interested parties to um, consider new corridors. Okay, thanks for that answer. Tim Conklin with the Regional Planning Commission. Uh, did have a question with regard to the bipartisan infrastructure law. The fact sheet that uh, USDOT pushed out back in December talked about 54 million over five years. Just wanted to uh, I know we're all waiting to learn more about how the federal funding gets uh, apportioned and pushed out to the states. Then also, I think in that law, it talked about a EV readiness plan that the state of Arkansas has to put together. So just any information you have on the 54 million coming to Arkansas and a state EV readiness plan. Thank you. Uh, again, I can take that. Uh, that money will be administered and that program will be administered by the Arkansas Department of Transportation. Um, it's possible that this office could assist, but that will be primarily their responsibility. Thank you. Appreciate that. Do we have uh, any more questions? Yeah, this is Brad McCaleb with the Arkansas Department of Transportation. I just wanted to, to comment on the plan that Tim mentioned. Uh, at this time, we are still waiting for uh, further guidance from Federal Highways on uh, the content of that plan and guidance on it. So uh, as soon as we have that information, we'll get started on putting the plan together and coordinating as necessary. Um, hi, this is Hunter with the Jones Center in North in Springdale, Arkansas. Just a quick question on the private residence. So, what if you're a private resident, privately owned organization, but available to the public? Would that still count? 
Um, as long as the charger is available to the public. So um, if you wanted to install a level two charger at your home, like in your driveway, and typically people from the public don't park there for a long amount of time and charge, right, right. you would not be able uh, to use this program. But any other installation, if you're a private business or you're a nonprofit, you're a government building, um, you can probably use this, prob this program for a reimbursement rebate. Uh, and it will just depend on how, uh, if it's available to the public or not, with how much you would uh, potentially get back. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions before we go? Uh, Tim Conklin again with Regional Planning to ask one more question. Uh, with regard to the interstates and highways on the corridors that have been designated, uh, you said there's a million dollars. Uh, how far does a million dollars go and do you prioritize the DC fast? I, I guess they have to be within that five or, or 50 mile uh, corridor is uh, I guess you're going to try to target every so many miles to get those right I think ready, uh, there's, Tim I think there might be some confusion with what the guidance that probably will come out with the federal money is and with this program this program is funded with the VW funds so um, a lot of that guidance that you've heard about um, every 50 miles and um, being within five miles of a designated corridor. Uh, while those are goals that Arkansas is going to work towards, they're not necessarily uh, required in this guidance for this program. And I think we've, we've kind of thought about, we might be able to get three stations out of the million dollars that we have. And, you know, this is a new program for uh, the energy office. And, um, you know, if, down the line, we are helping with RDOT's um, funding. We're trying to use this program to kind of um, test the waters and, and see where we need to do better and how we can help um, progress that infrastructure in the future when there will be a lot more opportunity for funding coming from uh, the federal funds. So right now, all of those federal guidance things that um, are going around aren't necessarily um, going to be used for this program right now. Thank you so much. That's very helpful. You're welcome. Okay. Well, if we don't have any more uh, questions, I guess we will call today. Thanks everybody for uh, stopping by and you can always contact me in the future if you have questions or you need uh, anything else for these programs. Thanks a lot and everybody have a good weekend.